Hi, good morning, um, everyone. Uh, my name is Elisa LaRue. I'll be chairing this uh, session today uh, for the SAGE webinar series on why environmental management uh, must become the new normal. And I am quite excited about our lineup. Uh, before we get started, uh, we'll give it another minute or so to make sure all the participants that are trying to join in are with us. Uh, and just generally speaking, for the sake of bandwidth, uh, I suggest that people do not um, have their videos on just while the uh, talk is happening. But you are very welcome after each um, after each speaker is finished to put up your hand uh, to either uh, speak directly and have your video on while you're asking questions, or uh, to chat in the chat box and ask questions there. It all depends on uh, your own connectivity and what works best for you. Uh, so while while I was speaking, we have had a minute passing. We have. 42 people in the audience today, and um, I'm sure the number might grow. So I think without further ado, I will start by introducing our first speaker. In general, today's lineup to me is very excited because we have both um, academics here and also practitioners, and then we have some people that are both practitioners and academics, uh, like our first speaker here. Um, which is uh, Dr. Chantelle Witten, and um, she's a registered dietitian with more than 20 years public health nutrition experience. Um, Chantelle has a PhD in nutrition from the Northwest University Center for Excellence for Nutrition, and she is an alumnus of the African Nutrition Leadership Program. Uh, Chantelle has worked across several sectors, including food industry, the NGO sector, and with United Nations agencies. Uh, she currently serves on the National Department of Health Ministerial Committee for the Morbidity and Mortality of Children Under Five Years, and as the Nutrition Lead for the South African Civil Society for Women's, Adolescents, and Children's Health. Uh, Chantelle, that is quite a mouthful, and I am very excited to hand over to you and um, uh, hear what you have to contribute. Thank you very much, and welcome. Thank you very much, Elisa. Um, for that introduction. So thank you very much for the um, invitation to present to the Scientific Advisory Committee on Emergencies and to be included in a new group of people that I don't generally um, engage with, with the um, environmental management. Um, sorry guys, I'm sorry, but the just jumping. So I'm not presenting a paper, I'm presenting on a community of practice and the community of practice is in the food and nutrition world. And we are reaching out, oh my goodness, sorry. I had this problem with the jumping slides. So I'm going to be presenting um, particularly on the food and nutrition profile of South Africa and how that engages with environmental management. When we look at food-based dietary guidelines, which dictate what countries should be doing in terms of food production, food um, availability, and then obviously how it impacts us as far as consumers. And then what are the food choices currently that is driving the dietary patterns of South Africa? And when we look at consumers who don't always see themselves, they see themselves as end users, but actually if we look at consumers, Consumers are actually the drivers of what gets produced, what gets marketed and what gets taken up. And how is this related to our United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are set for 2025. And of those 17 goals, we have three that are specifically related to nutrition. The first one is to reduce poverty and malnutrition. We have one that talks to child nutrition and the parameters around child nutrition. And the third one talks to sustainability. So I'm trying to link many concepts, but I'm going to leave some time for more discussion, um, given that this is the first time I will be engaging for this particular group on these topics. So as a nutritionist and a dietitian, we look at the health outcomes. So we're often looking at the manifestation of poor dietary intake, poor food quality. And unfortunately, South Africa's 
food and nutrition profile cannot be ignored on the basis that we have a large poverty inequality in South Africa. Uh, from the economist, we know that we have the highest Gini coefficient, which is just the disparity between the richest and the poorest. And the closest you get to one, the highest is that disparity. And South Africa at the moment is at six, uh, 0 0.65, which is the highest in global terms. So what should we be paying attention to here? We should be paying attention to the both the undernutrition for women, specifically our maternal anemia, Anemia is when you don't have enough iron. And WHO says that if your anemia is above 15% amongst pregnant women, then you have a, a, a problem, a public health problem. So you can see that our anemia rates are very high at 30%, which means almost one in three pregnant women are anemic, don't have enough iron intake. Then when we look at our exclusive breastfeeding rates, once the babies are born, how we feed the babies, and so South Africa has the lowest exclusive breastfeeding rate on the continent and one of the lowest in a middle income country. That means only one in three children are exclusively breastfed for zero to six months. And more um, concerning is that in 2016, from where this data is drawn from, 25%, one in four children did not breastfeed at all in the same age group. So while we have low exclusive breastfeeding rates, we also have high infant formula um, feeding. And then stunting, which is a global indicator that tells you how well a country is doing, looks at the height of children. And if the children are not at a healthy height for age, we call that stunting. They are too short for their age. And again, WHO sets standards. And if we are above a 15%, we are of significant public health problems. And you'll see South Africa has a high um, stunting rate at 27%, but also what's very concerning is that this 20%, 27% uh, has not changed over the last 27 years. So our first national survey was in 1996. Back then, our stunting rate was 26%, and it has fluctuated between 26 and 27%. So essentially over the last 27 years, it has stayed the same. I'm going to jump over to the overnutrition. And sadly, South Africa has an obesity and an overweight problem, both in maternal nutrition, but also more worrisome is in our childhood overweight. So we see that overweight and obesity is peaking in the age group one to three years. And again, we are world leaders, unfortunately, in childhood obesity. We have surpassed the obesity levels for the USA as well as Mexico, which means that our overweight children become our overweight adolescents, and so it puts an impact on the country. So why do we have food-based dietary guidelines? So the Food and Agriculture Organization back in 1996 came together with all the countries that are signatories to the United Nations and said, we need to look at how countries are producing food, and we need to look at how countries are marketing food. And what we've seen is that not only is it the production and the marketing of food, but it is also what the consumers are demanding, what the consumers are buying, and what the consumers are almost creating the demand. And so dietary guidelines have been established since, as I said, 1996, they've been um, refined over the years to look at dietary patterns. We've looked at nutrient patterns, and I'm talking at a global level. So what nutrients are missing? What nutrients are too much or too little? What foods are being product, um, produced? And then how does it play out in the nutrition space? So dietary guidelines is basically for public food and nutrition policies, health and agriculture policies, so that we may have healthy outcomes. Then we use also the dietary guidelines to do nutrition education. And in the nutrition education, we are trying to foster healthy eating habits and healthy lifestyles. And then finally, in the last 10 years, we've been, um, a lot of focus has been on sustainability and minimum impact on the environment. And I would like to give an example in terms of um, breastfeeding, just because it's World Breastfeeding Week and one or not one, it is the first food. And in terms of the first food, last year, 2019, 
WHO, which is the World Health Organization, UNICEF, which is specifically for children, they looked at what is the impact of breastfeeding on the world in terms of sustainability. And we know that breastfeeding, production by the mother, feeding to the baby is the shortest food system. And it has the lowest carbon footprint on the planet as a food system. It is also the first food system. This year we are talking about protect breastfeeding because if we are not going to be able to improve the environment for women to breastfeed, then breastfeeding rates are going to go down. And the UN has set, has set um, universal targets for countries to achieve exclusive breastfeeding. That means only giving breast milk in the first six months. And that is 50% of all children under the age of six months should be exclusively breastfed. And I showed you when I started my presentation that South Africa is only at 32%. One in three. For us to actually be able to meet the 50% means that we're going to have to implement accelerated efforts to move the breastfeeding agenda away from the formula and mixed feeding. So what has this got to do in terms of the impact, the production impact? I put a, a link for, um, sorry, I didn't put the reference in, but there's an article that talks about the environmental impact of formula in terms of its carbon footprint, and just as a conversion, you need one liter of cow's milk to produce 500, 150 grams. So if you need to buy a 500 tin of formula, it takes raw milk of 3.3 liters. So you can see that this is not a sustainable way. And if more and more women move towards formula feeding, the impact on the environment is huge that is excluding looking at the poor health outcomes. So all those outcomes that I showed you in terms of obesity and stunting have been directly related to poor infant feeding. So let's look at how we are making our choices in, in the context of South Africa. As I said, we cannot ignore the economic status that we are in right now. We cannot ignore the impact that COVID has had. We cannot ignore the production and the distribution of food that has impacted because of COVID and the lockdown. And so poverty and, in, and inequality become still the main drivers for poor health. And poor people make choices on the price of food. So if the food basket is too expensive, then we will not be having the healthy diets that we want to see in South Africa. And we are paying both the cost in terms of ill health, but also we are paying future because it's called intergenerational poverty. When a mom is in ill health, she delivers a baby that is underweight, a baby that is gestationally immature, and therefore you're paying more health costs in the future. So if we want to make these dietary choices and we want to have an impact on the environment, what is it that we need to be focusing on? How do we change this? For a very long time, the food and nutrition in, um, fraternity has focused on people's choices. But in this movement towards systems analysis, we have now galvanized around a concept called the food environment. And the food environment is the system from farm to fork. How does the food get produced? How does the, the food reach our shops? And then finally to our table. And in understanding the, this farm to fork system, we have recognized and we have documented in the South African context that firstly, there's a lack of credible information how people are making their food choices. There's a lot of misinformation. And so we need to be integrating the food and nutrition knowledge into learning programs, all learning programs for parents, for children, for consumers, and even for us as academics working in cross-sectoral or inter interdisciplinary um, context. I'm now going to introduce you to the food um, guide for South Africa. So you'll see that the food guide for South Africa starts with a circle in the middle, focusing very much on the starchy foods. And if I ask anybody now, what, was, what would be the one recommendation if you wanted to eat, eat healthy? 90% of people, and this is the HSRC survey, said that starchy food is bad for you. Starchy food makes you fat. Starchy food gives you diabetes. Starchy foods... Um, make you gain weight. And yet starchy foods across the globe 
is the basis of the diet, healthy diet. So if you look at people in China, what do they eat? People in Ghana, people in Mexico, globally, starchy foods provide maximum energy. And it is also the most e economic and cost-effective energy from a physiological point of view, because all our starchy foods, when we eat it, it converts to our glucose, which then supplies the body with energy. So in a sense, South Africa should be focusing on how to diversify the starchy food base so that its um, population doesn't have to spend additional money, doesn't have to um, spend money on foods that are not providing that energy, but are still expensive. And why am I raising this? is because five years ago, South Africa went through a huge transition in terms of discussing the Banting diet and was the Banting diet a public health strategy for South Africa. And it cannot be because the Banting diet focuses on protein. And if you look at the protein circles, you see the protein circles are very small because one, they are the most expensive foods. They are the high quality foods, but physiologically, they are also the foods that do not provide cost-effective energy. They are building blocks and so they are the smallest. I want to focus on the fruits and vegetables because this is an area that we can improve. This is an area that South Africa does produce enough fruits and vegetables, but the consumption pattern of the population is not on fruits and vegetables. In terms of consumption, WHO says we should be eating 400 grams of plant-based foods, which should come from fruits and vegetables, and South Africa only consumes 240. So we should all be eating five portions of fruits and vegetables every day. But if we look at the research, it shows that fruits and vegetables are very low on the consumers list. One, because it's expensive and two, it's not part of our usual dietary intake. We focus a lot on the high quality foods. You ask a mom, what is good foods to feed your child? She will always mention the high quality foods, milk, eggs, um, yogurt. So these are the foods that are foremost in consumers' minds. But again, when we look at the environmental impact, if as a population we were pushing for more people to eat fish, we would actually exhaust our fish stock. We would not be able to um, get, get our population to eat at the levels that we need to produce. So that's why we are focusing on the plant-based foods, which include your fruits and vegetables, your legumes. And then finally, a, a, a positive note for South Africa, is that South Africa, like many other countries, has put in regulations to control the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. And some research has shown now that we are finally um, turning the curve in terms of consumption of water. And that's why water conservation, water purification, water management is important because it has an impact also on agriculture. And then finally, on the consumption of the consumer. And so, promotion of water and water-based drinks, we are finally winning the, the, um, the war against sugar sweetened drinks. So that's very positive. So this particular food-based guideline has been in existence since 2003. But what we have seen across the different sectors, including education, basic education, higher education, including sports, where lots of sports nutrition um, is given out, is that we have not used it consistently as a public health tool. We have not been able to apply the South African food guide and food guidance in a way that makes sense to the different sectors from the food production, food marketing, and food consumption. And even when we think about environmental management in terms of food production, then when we look at the nutrition and what is pushing the, the production, then nutrition is very low on the list. Most people just are counting what is the production, but not looking at what is the impact on the people. And as I, I showed in the beginning, the health profile is really deteriorating with time. And, and so both as a community of practice as academics, but also as the government, trying to move the the consumption patterns of South Africa towards the food guide is paramount for us to reap the benefits of health. So, that slide was standing. Profilisa, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Are you? Are you? I'm frozen? not sure why I can't even escape to change slides. 
Oh dear. Uh, do you have uh, a few slides left? It's two slides that are left. I'm going to stop sharing. Hmm. Um, so just to go back in terms of um, South Africa, oh, it is changing. Is it changing for you as well? Um, on the, I on Zoom? See anything. I just see you at the moment, but I think you okay. can probably just I'm gonna, the I'm gonna, Yeah, I'm going to change. Hmm. I'm just going to the last two slides. Okay. So in terms of the healthy eating, what are we pushing for? We're pushing for more variety. And as I said, the starchy foods we still want to focus on. So we're looking at diversifying from maize and wheat and trying to improve the consumption of sorghum, millet, barley, um, teff. And we are looking at how this may um, change our dietary patterns. Another area that needs a lot of research and a lot of support is the promotion of indigenous vegetables and fruits mostly known as the forgotten um, vegetables because they used to be a huge market for green leafy vegetables in our northern provinces but we see that that's also decreased significantly over time so trying to get these to market and trying to market these as um, sources for um, consumption as commercial consumption is another area that we are focusing on and then an alternative to animal source foods that is taking um, off is looking at insects and other bugs and alternative food sources because again, the protein foods are very expensive. And if we want to improve the quality of foods for children specifically, then meat and meat products are proving to be very expensive. And the Asian countries have done very well to include alternative meat sources. This is a, a, a diagram that is promoted by the World Health Organization in terms of looking at how do we get food from production. So we're looking at from the policies that look at how much we should be producing in South Africa. And unfortunately, South Africa is still very much focused on the production of staples, and we haven't yet diversified towards our fruits and vegetables, as I was talking. And if you look at the outer ring of the yellow ring, these are the tools that we're using to move the system of food production to food consumption. Because South Africa is spending a lot of money on the blue ring. We are investing in when we look at the health outcomes in terms of malnutrition, that is where most of the money is going. And in terms of our efforts, South Africa needs to go back to look at a systems approach. And we are looking at this farm, farm to fork approach. And all sectors that may engage in any of these systems should be pushing in the same direction if we want to see the changes we are talking about. So to meet the, um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we need to do more knowledge brokering. This is an action um, given by WHO and FAO. And as the nutrition and food communities, we are trying to do that for all sectors and agencies that are working in, in, um, in the food and health sector. In the health sector, we are particularly working on the double burden. And that double burden is stunting in children and overweight in adults. And it's the same it is in the same household. So therefore the food patterns is, is our answer. Increased nutrition capacity in the WHO guidelines, we are not talking about training more nutritionists and dietitians, but we're actually asking for more nutrition to be included in academic programs where people do engage with um, food and nutrition. And then finally as consumers and um, health consumers as well. We are strengthening the advocacy to support the food and nutrition specifically through the COVID recovery phase because during COVID, we saw a, a large attention to households that were running without food. And that is exacerbating the burden of food insecurity in South Africa. And so therefore COVID has given us the opportunity to start engaging. And we're looking for more opportunities to monitor and document um, initiatives that are rolling out, especially in terms of the small scale farmers, uh, food initiatives that are help, um, happening. And for us and the local communities that are engaged in food and nutrition is to actually have a coordinated um, approach so that we have the academic lens for writing up these community-led um, opportunities and for us to use it as local knowledge so that we may impact at a global level. As I said, for all countries signatory to the UN, we've all committed that we will reduce hunger and we will improve child nutrition for the future. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Chantal. That was uh, fascinating. I have so many questions popping up in my head. 
uh, I really appreciate uh, your presentation. Um, I, I feel like I'd like to give others a chance to ask questions, but since I'm lucky enough to perhaps have the floor for now, I am particularly intrigued um, because from some um, environmental and from a zoological perspective, of course, we're very aware of how the current COVID pandemic was caused by a zoonosis, and that has been driven to a large extent by our meat consumption patterns and the fact that we, you know, pack animals into, you know, meat uh, battery, battery chicken into batteries, you know, and uh, feed lots and things like that. Um, so uh, our demand is driving the risk for increased future zoonotic pandemics. And then, as you say, the, um, the recommendations are actually that we shouldn't be focusing so much on animal-based foods, right? Mm -hmm. How do you think we can use COVID, the, like the current, you know, crisis, to, to help drive change towards a more plant-based uh, diet uh, where you know the viruses that emerge from plants are not so threatening to us, basically. Yes, thank you, Elisa. I think um, I see Stephanie's also asked the question about animal products. So I think COVID has really brought nutrition into sharp focus because now the communication is much wider. It's in the media. People are learning a lot more about the risk of obesity and malnutrition, particularly in adults. And so we have this opportunity now. In terms of protein consumption, it's also a cultural perspective, especially as South Africans. If you go anywhere and you talk about food, people are more likely to tell you, hey, we had this lekker barai and, and focus on the chops rather than on the, you know, the millipop that was served with it. When people talk about you know, status, they will usually use food because they know that food has a very high, and proteins specifically have high quality um, status symbols. So we have to move the needle cautiously towards more plant-based. But I think it was because plant-based, especially the starchy foods, got a very bad rap. You know, most people believe that starchy foods make you fat. And so when people cut down on the starches, they automatically have to, you know, increase somewhere else. So it's usually, give me a little bit of rice and two pieces of meat. And, and the reality is that the guidelines have not been used to, to to kind of push this, this cultural change that we need. But also it, it does mean that we need to have consumers buying and asking for more fruits and vegetables. And I think when everybody starts talking the same, the same message, I think South Africa can get there. I, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I <laughs> Thank see you very much. quite a few other questions coming, but unfortunately we're going to um, have to move on to the next speaker too, because I know, uh, we, we don't want to um, run too much over our time. Um, Chantal, if you have the energy, the mental energy to pay attention to the um, chat box, you could also try to answer some questions from the chat box, perhaps, in the interest of time. Or otherwise, of course, uh, we can put people in touch afterwards for more questions and answers, even on the Facebook site um, later, where this will all be posted. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, our next speaker is uh, from my institution, uh, the University of the Free State here in Korkwa. It's Professor Jeffrey Mukwada, who will be talking about environmental management as the new normal towards the framework for the COVID-19 pandemic analysis. Now, um, Jeffrey is a professor in, of environmental geography. He holds a master's degree in environmental policy and planning from the University of Zimbabwe and a PhD in environmental geography from the University of the Witwatersrand. He also holds professional qualifications in education, human resource management, and project management. Now, Jeffrey's main research interests are in climate change, natural resource management, and rural livelihoods, especially in mountain environments, which is where we are now. Uh, during his spare time, he enjoys reading fiction, politics, and philosophy. And I really look forward to your talk, Jeffrey. Uh, I hope you'll be able to share your screen with us and please let, let us know if, um, yep, I see your screen sharing is starting. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, first of all, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the organizers uh, of this event, Professor Lelu and Dr. Naidu. Um, my talk this afternoon is on environmental management as the new normal 
towards the framework for the COVID-19 pandemic analysis. I would like to start with uh, uh, two press statements that were made on the 5th of July uh, 2021 by the elders. Uh, for those who are not familiar with who the elders are, elders are those people and or club uh, of former political leaders, especially prime ministers and uh, presidents. Uh, one of them is uh, Mary Robinson, who is the current chairperson, who noted that COVID-19 must not be seen as a health crisis alone. It is a political, economic, social, and human rights crisis, and the consequences of both the virus and the disastrous failures of international leaders since the beginning of 2020 will be fair for many years to come. Uh, another a statement came from Gro Harlem Brooklyn, the former Norwegian Prime Minister and former Director General of the World Health Organization, who stated uh, the world stands at a critical moment in its response to the pandemic and its attempt to prevent future disasters. Thus far, the record of heads of state has been more, almost uniformly inadequate. And the response of the G7 rich industrialized countries at their recent summit in the United Kingdom was particularly disappointing. Ladies and gentlemen, these two excerpts uh, are telling in a number of ways. And um, there are five conclusions that I could draw from this uh, statement. The first one is that the pandemic is multidimensional. And the second is that the consequences of the continual spreading of the pandemic are disastrous. Thirdly, the world is divided in its capacity uh, to deal with the problem. And the most noticeable being the division between the poor and the rich countries. And fourthly, there are ethical concerns, including women rights issues. And the last is that there is dissatisfaction regarding how the pandemic is being handled. But first of all, what is it that we know about the COVID-19 pandemic? The first thing that we know for sure is that the causative agent of COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2. That is what we know. Uh, secondly, what we also know is that it is spreading um, uh, rapidly. Uh, in uh, January 2020, there were only 282 cases. Uh, a year later, the number of cases that were reported rose to over 81 million. And uh, six months afterward, uh, there was an increase by another 100 million. Uh, after which within the last 30 days, it rose by almost another 20 million, uh, which is phenomenal. What we also do is that if geographic spread is uneven, by looking at this map here, you can tell the uh, differences in different parts of uh, the continent of, of, of the world, uh, of the number of cases that were reported and in, uh, the deaths that resulted from the pandemic. That is one thing that we know. However, there's a lot more that we do not know. The first thing that we don't know uh, is uh, the origins of this problem. That is the first thing that we do not know and controversies and speculations surrounding the origins of COVID-19 are fatal grounds for conspiracy theories. And I would like to believe that we have heard many of them, one of which suggests that COVID-19 escaped from a laboratory experiment that went wrong. A typical example cited in this case is the Wuhan 
uh, Institute of Virology in China, where the virus is alleged to have escaped from a laboratory. Another view uh, or claim uh, is that there are some pharmaceutical pharmaceutical corporations that engineer the virus, thus genetically modifying it in order to make a killing on profit. Yet we also hear of other suggestions uh, that maintain that some scientists have intentions uh, of altering, altering the human genome, uh, either by creating the virus or through the vaccines uh, that are being uh, developed. So all these are concerns uh, that you have heard about. Uh, there is also a theory that is related to archaeology, suggesting that uh, the virus may have uh, been let out from an old archaeological site, uh, which could have been an old burial site or a tomb, uh, perhaps dating back to one of the ancient civilizations. Uh, these are the things that are being peddled um, as a result of um, what we don't know about the COVID pandemic. Also, what we don't know about the COVID pandemic are the emerging trends. There is hardly much that we know about how it is spreading. As of uh, the 26th of July, 2021, uh, the figures across the world were as follows. Uh, if you look at these uh, figures here, you can tell where uh, most of uh, the human population has been affected. But this virus is not limited uh, to uh, the human population only. It is also affecting uh, even livestock and other animals. Uh, what is interesting, though, to note is that even though the first cases were reported in China, uh, it is uh, in China that probably uh, some of the smallest numbers uh, have been reported of late. Uh, by the week ending preceding the 26th uh, of July, 2021, uh, the statistics were as followed. The number of people who were uh, infected by the virus, uh, starting from Brazil, uh, especially in the, especially in the uh, BRICS countries, uh, varied just phenomenally. If you make a comparison again, you can see that the numbers are, are huge. All these numbers were reported in just one week. And again, uh, what we notice is that there are very few cases that were reported in China compared to other parts of the world. And one wonders uh, why this is the case. And secondly, why is it that the rest of the world is so proud not to learn from what is happening in China uh, by way of controlling the spread of the virus? Uh, these are the questions that come into my mind when I start thinking about how we can frame our understanding of how the COVID pandemic uh, crisis uh, is affecting humanity. The other thing that we don't know is a response to this concern by uh, Graham Brutland. We need agent action and delivery, not just on vaccine production and distribution. Now, the question, what is really unknown here is what agent action is needed? What agent action can we take? Now, in order to arrive at some questions uh, and answers uh, related to that particular question, uh, we need to have some kind of a frame. Uh, a frame, by definition, is a cognitive device that can be used as an interpretive lens through which we can see and make sense of the complex situations uh, that is portrayed uh, by the pandemic crisis. 
Uh, what came into my mind when I was thinking about how to frame uh, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, a total of 10 possible frameworks. The first one being uh, the Hyogo framework for action, which was uh, proposed in 2005 at the World Conference on Disaster Reduction um, in, in Japan. And this conference was on building resilience uh, of nations and communities to disasters. And they came up with three recommendations at that conference. The first one is that there has got to be adequate uh, assessment of risks associated with disasters. And secondly, there has to be some management of this risk, but both the risk assessment and the risk management need to be communicated, which uh, was the third um, uh, recommendation. Now, looking at this, uh, we cannot um, uh, shy away from the reality that when we are dealing with the COVID pandemic, we are dealing with a disaster. Uh, we are dealing with a disaster and what needs to be done is to find a way of assessing this risk and uh, its risks and also how to manage the risk and communicate um, um, about, uh, about the two. The second um, framework that came into my mind as well uh, was uh, Node 2 Science, which was proposed by Michael Gibson, uh, Helga Mawantu, and Peter Scott in 1994. Now, uh, unlike Node uh, mod, uh, 1 Science, Node 2 Science uh, suggests that uh, we must have a new paradigm of knowledge production that is socially sensitive, uh, application oriented, uh, uh, transdisciplinary, uh, as well as one that allows for those who peddle uh, information uh, to be held accountable. Now, it is unlike in not one sign, in not one science. Uh, emphasis is on uh, gathering empirical evidence for trends and uh, uh, patterns uh, of phenomena identified, uh, which is of course uh, uh, discredited, discredited by others for a number of reasons. One of which is, is that it, it tends to be hegemonic because it forces people to focus on uh, theoretical and experimental science. Uh, and also locks people in disciplinary uh, silos. Now, having said this, uh, I want to quickly move on to the next uh, 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 possible framework, which is the post-normal science, which was proposed uh, by uh, Fundowski and uh, and others in 1991. Uh, in post-normal science, we see science being divided into three major domains, uh, including uh, applied science and then what is referred to as post-normal science. Uh, in between, we work uh, a professional consultant's form of science. They are in a continuum whereby applied science uh, assumes the lowest value in terms of um, uh, decision making, whereas post normal science is that kind of science which comes after the normal science and is found uh, to be the one that is most desirable in terms of decision making. Uh, the next one that I want to allude to very briefly is uh, techno fixes, which was noted uh, by. Uh, Ralph Dow and uh, Raman in 2020. In this approach, it is assumed that uh, all our answers, the things that we need, especially uh, in relation to the current pandemic crisis, um, 
should be coming from engineering and technology. That is where solution can be found. Well, this may be true. It can also be equally argued that it is probably engineering and science that may have taken us to the current crisis in which we are. And the next one that I would like to uh, refer to very briefly also is uh, the user-driven innovation, which was uh, proposed by uh, von Heipel in 2005. According to this um, approach, innovators must work directly with users in order to pr pr produce uh, new knowledge and also to produce uh, new products through co-creation, customization, and uh, crowdsourcing. Now, we may already have seen a number of uh, new uh, technologies emerging on the market as a result of the current crisis. Uh, for example, we now have uh, uh, sanitizer dispensers of all makes and kinds. We now have some ventilation machines of all, all design. And also, uh, alongside these developments, we have seen decoctions and uh, concussions uh, uh, being proposed and developed uh, in line with the knowledge uh, systems uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, the last one, before I focus on uh, what I think is ideal and which should be understood in a better way, is the social innovation uh, approach. And this is what was uh, mooted by the Organization for Economic uh, cooperation and development countries, as well as the Bureau of European uh, Policy Advisor, who refer to uh, social innovation in the design and implementation of new solutions that imply conceptual uh, process, product, and organizational change that will benefit individuals in the societies or communities in which they live. Now, when I look at these first six uh, uh, possible frameworks. Uh, what comes into my mind is that uh, traditional science in general is seen as uh, not enough and is seen as limited and powerless in uh, providing solutions to the current pandemic crisis. And society might have to tend to esoteric knowledge systems in order to find others. Uh, just a few uh, quick questions that I would like to raise before I move on to the uh, last four uh, uh, frameworks. Uh, the, 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 the questions that need to be addressed in any analytical framework uh, as follows. Number one, how serious is the problem that needs to be addressed? And secondly, how is it affecting us? And thirdly, how can it be addressed? And uh, uh, lastly, how do we manage our environment under the uh, threat posed by the problem? These are the answer, the question that I'm going to try to answer using the last four uh, proposed frameworks. Now, all of these four are based on systems thinking. And by definition, a system, by definition, a system is made up with an integral component of, of parts which in turn are made up of objects, elements, each of which have got attributes. And these attributes are rooted in the biophysical, economic, political, and social domain, which makes the whole system uh, complicated. For example, as an illustration here, when we look at the pandemic crisis within, uh, within uh, the context of systems approach, what we see is the interconnectedness of uh, issues, including contamination 
of the environment that leads to the transmission of uh, the disease to, to people and the transmission of events uh, leading to changes in the populations or uh, leading to uh, people who will be affected um, as a result of uh, uh, vulnerability or susceptibility. We, we see that all these things uh, do happen in the environment as a result of as a result of what will be happening through the interaction between the different spheres of environment, including biophysical, uh, social, economic, and political environment, the decisions that are made there, which might actually lead to the spread and worsening of the situation. All right. This is why those elders were complaining and raising issues about uh, how the current situation is not being handled properly. But having said this, let me just uh, move on to the first uh, theoretical framework that answers the first question that I raised earlier. How serious is this problem? And to answer this question, we must turn to the wicked problems, uh, which was proposed by uh, writer and thereby 1973. According to this uh, uh, framework, the origin of a problem which is referred to as a wicked problem is usually not known or it is usually not clear. In this particular case, what we notice about the COVID uh, pandemic is that uh, the virus responsible for this pandemic is not uh, clearly uh, 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 known, it's not known where it actually came from. Its origins Jesse, are not, are not uh, known. Hello? Jesse, Jesse uh, can I just interrupt yes. you? Uh, we, we are a bit running um, tight on time. Um, if you can wrap it up in, in the next minute, that would be great. Otherwise, we might not fit in all of the speakers. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, how much more time do I, do I have? No, you're actually over time already. So if you can um, wrap up in a in, in minute, that would be great. Okay, and uh, let me uh, sum up. Uh, what I intended to, 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 to do was introduce you to four critical things. Um, one of them uh, is about the first question, how serious is this problem? We are talking about something that we don't quite understand sufficiently. And secondly, we are going to look into uh, how the, the population in general, the human population is affected by referring to yet another important theory, world systems theory. Uh, it was going to address the question, how is this uh, pandemic af affecting us? And another thing that I was going to do, um, if time had allowed me, uh, was to uh, relate the current risk to the condition that characterize the environment, that is the vulnerability of those who are affected um, and the characteristic of the hazards. Because the risk is directly proportional to these two, but also inversely proportional to the capacity of those affected. I was also going to relate to the characteristics of the hazards. And lastly, the, the most important thing that I was going to refer to was uh, how we can manage the current crisis and also prepare for future uh, crises of the same nature using the BBC model. And uh, the last thing, if you may allow me just to read out in a few statements uh, by way of conclusion, is that any framework that should be adopted must say, first of all, uh, um, address these several things that are not known about uh, the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, secondly, I was going to say that the pandemic poses a huge risk, not only to life, but also to livelihoods. And thirdly, the pandemic has, uh, has had a disproportionate effect on society. 
uh, particularly the difference that exists between the developed and the developing world. The fourth is that at any level or scale, a unified approach must be adopted in order to arrive at the solution to this problem. Uh, fifthly, I was also going to say uh, there is need for a holistic approach, which is both systematic and uh, systemic. Uh, lastly, uh, because of uh, our lack of preparedness, it will be necessary to have a comprehensive emergency management approach in which we have, uh, when we fail to prepare, we have got at least to respond adequately to the disaster so that we recover and um, um, at the same time, finally, um, we would need to have a change of mindset uh, so that we become more resilient, focused, uh, with the aim of build, building better what has already, already been, been lost. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, for... Thank, thank you so much, Jeffrey. I appreciate the talk. Sorry that I had to cut you short, but we are packing in so much in this webinar series. And as you'd rightly say, this is an absolutely complex systems level and novel challenge. Um, I ask that uh, participants please ask questions in the in the chat box for for Jeffrey, or afterwards you can also go onto Facebook and see if you have more questions. You can pose them there. I'd like to um, move on to our next speaker, uh, which is uh, Matlori Tao. He um, is the, a director at Sandy, uh, responsible for the biodiversity mainstreaming directorate. Um, his key responsibility is to lead Sambi's program of work on mainstreaming biodiversity and ecological infrastructure into a range of strategic sectors, including rural development, the water sector, and agriculture. Um, his expertise is in the field of environmental governance, uh, biodiversity conservation, CBNRM, transformative innovative planning, and working at the confluence of the science policy uh, interface. Um, he, Matlori and his team, they're currently working um, uh, uh, WRC funded project, the Living Catchments Project, uh, which is intended to strengthen the enabling environment for water governance in South Africa. Um, and Matlori holds an MSc in Grassland Science from uh, UKZN. Uh, thank you, uh, Matlori. I will, I'm happy for you to uh, take over and uh, share your screen with us. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. All right. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Prof. Um, are you able to see my screen? And am I also audible? Um, at the moment, I'm not sure if I'm still seeing. Yes, there we go. Your screen is now visible, yep, and you're audible. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. As as uh, as uh, as Alice said, um, Matrodi from uh, I'm with the South African National Biodiversity Institute. It's a uh, it's an agency of uh, the Department of Environmental Affairs. Well, the name has changed, it's DFFE. Um, I, I'm going to talk about um, the journey that we've been, um, that we've been taking since uh, some time back, a while back, on uh, investing in ecological infrastructure for, for water security. Um, I kept my presentation at a much higher level, simple higher level. I wasn't sure of the, the audience. So I hope uh, what I'm going to share with you, you'll be able to follow and understand. This is just an overview of uh, my presentation. Um, so, so starting with what, what is it that we're talking about here when we, when we talk about um, the concept of investing in ecological infrastructure. What is it about? Um, we are saying um, ecological infrastructure, it refers to naturally functioning ecosystems that generate and deliver valuable services to people. This concept started some time back where we were looking at, uh, where we were saying as the biodiversity sector, uh, Sandy, we, our mandate is on biodiversity conservation, monitoring, uh, reporting to the minister and to, and to the people of South Africa, how do we, how can we change our messaging 
to the people of South Africa to understand what we are all about. So also demonstrate our value as uh, as Sunday as um, um, and, and we are we are in the biodiversity sector and we know that we know our relevancy to the development agenda of the country. So that's where this concept is coming from. That people are familiar with with uh, the built infrastructure because they're able to see the roads, uh, the bridges, the the dams. They can see that, but but we needed to find a way of communicating the messaging of biodiversity benefits and, and ecological infrastructure makes so much sense. And we're able to say it is an equivalent of the build infrastructure that you are used to is just as important. And, and it's, these are our rivers, our wetlands, our mountain catchments. And when we're saying we need to invest in ecological infrastructure, we basically, we are saying we, 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 we want to mobilize communities, we want to mobilize the citizen of South Africa to, towards maintaining the functioning of this infrastructure, the ecological infrastructure, the functioning of our rivers. We can't lose the function of our rivers, of our mountain catchments. We need to maintain those. And where there's degradation, we need to rehabilitate those because they are just as important. So that's where the, the concept of ecological infrastructure is coming from. And we were trying, we've been working on communicating the case for investing in ecological infrastructure because we were moving away from the messaging of biodiversity. Biodiversity is threatened. We have endemic plants here, they are threatened. People are not getting it because our target was, was, was we recognize that uh, a large strength of our land, of what we call critical biodiversity areas, it, it, it's, it's in the hands of the private sector in the hands of the production sector, how do we then communicate our benefits and show our relevance into the production sector? And we came up with this old, uh, whole range of messaging to link it also to not just talk about the ecosystem services that are coming out, but to say, yes, land management intervention is important. Yes, ecosystem services through land, sustainable land management, what you get is, is improved ecosystem services, but it doesn't end there. It leads to improved human well-being. And, and we were trying to find the, the linkages of the work that we are doing to, into, to addressing the societal challenges that we are sitting with as a, as, as a country. So to make, to make that linkages very clearly. So that's what we've been, we've been working on. We know about the sustainable development goals, our 2020, 2030 agenda. This is this is will always be a work on progress. We, you can feel it. We can feel all, all of it in terms of uh, the benefit of EI to say how does it uh, how does it links to the to our SDGs. Um, anyone who it depends on which sector you sitting in, are you sitting in or are you from and your understanding of ecological infrastructure. You can be able to see the linkages of the concept of investing in ecological infrastructure and how it contributes to our 2030 agenda. So it is that conversations that, that we were having. And for us to say, to, we were saying, how can we do this better? We got the concept, we are doing the messaging, we are receiving tractions, um, but how do we actually go out there and make this even more visible? The concept of investing in ecological infrastructure we started in. Um, we, we we started with. Uh, we said what we need to do is to establish these catchment-based partnerships. So we know that in all the catchments that we are in, you have NGOs, you have researchers, you have communities, uh, government department, or all spheres of government. You found them in all these catchments, and they are all doing they can actually coordinate and match towards a common vision. So that was what we were saying that, let's all come together. Let's all have this vision that we all aspire to achieve and we all match together. And we started this in, in KwaZulu Natal with the establishment of uh, Umgen Ecological Infrastructure Partnership, because we believe that we need to move away from, I am Sandy, I am KZ and Wildlife, and this is what I do. But we need to say, I am Sandy, I'm KZ and Wildlife, I am Umgeni, what I'm, I am Etequini, I am University of KwaZulu Natal. When we come together, what is our common vision around investing in ecological infrastructure? And we were very, we were very particular in terms of 
uh, the work that we want to do, it was the focus. We wanted to focus more on uh, water security. Uh, we know that water underpins the development agenda of this country. We can't do anything without water. Our economy needs water to grow. And we know that South Africa is a, is a water scarce country. Um, those who are, who've been following what's happening in the water sector, we, um, we have, we have serious water challenges right now. And, and with the Department of Water and Sanitation telling us that by 20, 2030, we will have a serious significant deficit of about 17% unless we do something now. So we, it was very important for us, Sunbi, being from the biodiversity sector, trying to demonstrate our relevance to the societal challenges. The, and we, cho we chose the water, 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 water sector and the water challenges that we are currently facing and what is it that we can proactively do now. And, and this catchment-based partnership that we, well, we, 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 we led the establishment of the one in Mgeni and with that came the Umzimbubu catchment partnership. Some may be familiar with it, it's in the Eastern Cape. Uh, we were part of that to say, let's start working together. Let's start closing the feedback loop between scientists, practitioners, implementers on the ground and policy practitioners. So these partnerships are really about that. And, and through as uh, um, when I was introduced, talking about the Living Catchments Project, we not only in Umzimvubu, but we we are now in the also in the Upper Tugela, that's in KwaZulu Natal, that breeder catchments and the olifants, really trying to enhance the catchment governance because it's the only way for us to move forward is is, is about let's let's work together, um, and 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 we we and and also what is important is that we we know that through good water governance. We, we believe that good water, uh, uh, water governance, it also will, will also eliminate the inequalities. Um, um, we still need to <laughs> put some evidence into that, but we believe it, it, it does. And, and, and through the catchment partnerships that we, we've, we have established, what we have is what we call, we call the learning platforms. Yes, you can establish this catchment partnership and we can all come together and develop a strategy and it ends there, but that's not how we want to operate. That's not how we should be working. It's through these catchment based partnerships. What we need is to create a space for learnings, to a space for co-learning, a space for co-creation of solutions. So we all come together. Uh, the communities, are, 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 are this, we close the feedback loop that the scientists are, are saying, what are the research needs in this, in this particular catchment? So, so, so these spaces that we are creating they are exactly for that. What's coming out of the, 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 the research findings, if there's a way that that can find its way into policy development processes, that's what we want to see uh, to facilitate the uptake of the work that our scientists are doing. We want to see that into policies, but we also want to see practitioners, what's coming out with the best practices from the, so, so, so these learning platforms are really they are created for that. And they are in various catchments, as I said, in Umgeni, Umzimvubu, Berk Briede. We are starting now in the Upper Tugela and, and, and the Olifants, but we need to close that. We need to close the gap, the, 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 the feedback loop. So and 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 and, and facilitate the and and be, we become like knowledge brokers of the science policy practice interface. So we get everybody together. That's that's the idea, and we do that at catchments. Uh, a, a, after every two years, we have what we call the ecological infrastructure endeavor. For us to create a space for learning, a space for co-creation of solutions, um, of, of uh, 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 the, the space of adaptive management, that, that is what we believe we need to be doing for us to say, indeed, we are investing in ecological infrastructure for water securities. We cannot we ignore uh, the work that, uh, the, in particular, the civil societies are doing um, in, in all these catchments where they are mobilizing communities into actions. And, and our role there at Sunbeast to say, bring those communities in, bring them into these partnerships, 
let's hear what they're doing. Not only that, let's go and see what these communities are doing. And, and the platforms that we are, we, we've created, they, are, they serve that purpose. So it, it's really, it's all of us. We need, we need each other. In, when we talk about the, the the water security crisis in the in the in, in the country, um, well, we cannot stop there. We need to be influencing planning and policies. We know that um, our government departments they need a mandate to do to act on anything. They need uh, 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 they, they're guided by the the, the policies. But they're guided by their plans for them to be able to implement anything. And, and, and what we were saying is that with these catchment but partnerships that, because now we are demonstrating the value of investing in ecological infrastructure, and we were able to see the uptake of this concept into various planning policy processes, um, um, which really make us very happy. This is just an example. There are many, many where we can actually see now ecological infrastructure recognized in, in, in various policy processes, uh, ecological infrastructure becoming more recognized into, into planning, because that's also important. While we are mobilizing on the ground, what are we saying about the mandates? Uh, is, is it shifting? Can we shift the mandates of these government departments in particular? either being water and sanitation or it's rural development or our own department of environmental affairs and and with the concept of investing in ecological infrastructure it was just really about that it's on the ground but also looking at influencing planning and policies this is just an example of what is currently happening in the in kwazulu natal on the development of the pro proto catchment management strategy there's a lot of signs that goes into these in terms of the mapping the natural capital account. This is where it becomes so important now. So now what we are seeing is us as Sunbi really working with scientists and the scientists are providing direct, we are seeing a direct benefits of the scientific work into policies and, 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 and strategies. And, and this is how we want to see, to say, if we want to, if we talk about water security, this is how it should be done. And, and this is just one of the, the many examples in terms of how, what we are doing uh, in, in, in various catchments. We want to see what will come up out of uh, the work that we're doing in Upper Chugela, uh, in Olifants, if we can be able also to influence our, our, our policy processes, strategic plans, maybe of the local municipalities there, bring them on board. What are they doing? How can we work together? Bring in the, the scientists, these are, this is what we have, this is what goes. So those learning platforms that we are talked about, they are exactly for us to open up conversations so that we move, we move together, we march together. Um, equally important uh, is on influencing an inclusive green economy. We, we know, we know, we, we really, what is at, at the center of an, an inclusive green economy is that it has to be people-centered. We know the green economy from what you read is about improving the human well-being, build social equity, reducing environmental risk. And, and through the journey that we've been, what we've embarked on for some time, what, what is emerging right now is, is, is very impressive. We love what is emerging around the work that we are doing, we're saying now, if we can invest in our strategic water source area, remember what I said, ecological infrastructure, our mountain catchments, these are ecological, uh, eco, uh, they are um, our, our EI. And, and, and so the, the mountain catchments, um, if we invest in these mountain catchments, we know they are powering our economy. And if we were to talk about the green economy, th this is just another way of the many ways of explaining the green economy. But if we can see an investment in, into these mountain catchments, we will indeed say our economy is matching towards a green, a green economy because now we will be investing in ecological infrastructure. And we, we, are, we are very happy with, with, with what is happening now. We have a target in the medium term strategic framework of the DFFE to secure 11 strategic water source areas. These are the mountain, the mountain catchments. 
and this is where we this is this where we're going to start. Um, this is us DFFE. This project Sunbe supporting, providing technical support, but it's led by DFFE and DWS, and we are we are mobilizing civil societies, other department, um, government departments to be part of this, this, what we've now started. And, and remember what I talked about, the partnerships, the learning platforms. What is great now is that as Sunbian partners are in this catchment, we are laying the ground for this work already. So when, when the DFFP season, we are starting this work, we will say as partners, Sunbian partners, we already galvanize communities. We have these partnerships. It's, it's, it's really now about just just doing doing the 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 the, the to hit that we're going to hit the ground running. And this is where our green economy, as part of our contributions, the green economy will look like as a start. And uh, because we need to secure this, and securing this is not really doesn't just mean protection. It's protection and many other things that we need to be doing in this space is kind of being protection, protecting this mountain, legally protecting them. It's, it's the partnerships, is is the rehabilitation work, is the financing, it's all of that. That's the, 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 so we have started on this journey. We are trying to develop this uh, so strategic water source area roadmap. We want to see how it will look like. We need to understand when we mean, we want to secure this strategic water source areas as part of powering our green economy, how will that look like? And so the work that we've started just creating learning platforms, we can see the uptake now, which is, this is what we, this is what we, we, we want to see. But having said all the nice things, work in progress, a social learning process on changing the way people make choices about the role of ecosystem in the water supply chain. This is very important, this is ongoing in terms of how can we integrate ecological infrastructure into the planning, the financing, and the development of the build infrastructure. Because it's, it's, it's nice to say what I've said, but this is it's where we are at. And this is what we want to see EI, because when we say government has allocated billions of runs to the building of the dam, and we are saying, can part of that be allocated towards maintaining ecological infrastructure? Toward uh, are, are rehabilitating ecological infrastructure, as, as we have seen from my slides, the ecosystem safety that are coming out of, of, out of our EEI, water is one of them. Can we work together there? And that's where, that, that, that's where we are at. And- uh, um, Mashori? Mashori? Um, yeah. Mashori? So thank you very much. I see there are already questions popping up for you in the chat box. Um, okay. Uh, I, I, I think uh, we should try to move on to the next or uh, our final speaker for the day. This, yeah, there's a lot of food for thought here, and uh, I, uh, <laughs> thank, I, I, thank I think you. this was the last slide. Oh, uh, okay, brilliant. <laughs> okay, let, 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 let me acknowledge my funders, the GEF Department of Science and Innovation and Water Research. All that I've said is funded by these these organizations. Thanks, sir. That's great. Thank you so much, Maslody. And uh, you're going to have your hands full answering all those questions in the chat box. I'd, I'd love it if you can um, uh, turn your attention there. We won't have time now for a uh, verbal Q&A, but I'd love to. Move, but thank you so much. I love the bottom-up approach. It is definitely reaping fruit. Um, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, our next speaker is uh, Prof. Shola Ololade. She holds a PhD in environmental management from the University of Joburg. Um, and she's an associate professor at the University of the Free State. Her areas of expertise include land use, land cover analysis, uh, water, energy, ne food nexus, and environmental sustainability. Uh, Shola has co-authored or authored 36 peer-reviewed journal articles, six book chapters, and six peer-reviewed conference proceedings. She supervised and graduated 19 masters and two PhD students. Um, Shola is also regularly a reviewer for more than 15 international journals and has presented 24 conference papers, uh, 20 of which are international conference and six of them have been an invited guest speaker. And of course, you are an invited guest speaker to our, our webinar series here today. Thank you for being here. Um, and uh, the floor is now yours. Uh, okay, thanks, Aliza. Um... I'll just try and share my screen right now. 
Um, just let me know whether we can see my screen. Yes, you're visible and audible. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm just going to, uh, first of all, use this opportunity to thank um, Professor Leroux and Dr. Naidu for inviting me to be uh, one of the speaker in this web, uh, web seminar. And uh, I must say it's been an interesting one. I joined last week as well, and I've been gaining a lot from, uh, from the speakers. I see my slide is trying to run, a <laughs> run faster than me. You know? um, Sorry, I'm just going to uh, go back to uh, the beginning. So I will be talking about the pathway towards uh, climate mitigation and resilience, um, that it requires a transdisciplinary approach. So um, in essence, I'm saying that the way uh, we were doing it in the past needs to change. If we are, be, if we are going to actually um, achieve a lot of sources uh, in terms of uh, climate mitigation. So I'm going to just on um, this slide. I'm going to give a brief background to my presentation. Um, the world is facing a rapid climate change uh, with different effects on different sectors. So whether it's the water sector, energy sector, agriculture, food, you know, even transport. Talk about any um, any sectors, you know. Uh, so basically. Uh, climate changes have, have an overall effect on all those sectors. So, and, and because of the, the, this impact, we are seeing heat waves, flood, wildfires, drought, and loss of the biodiversity, just to name a few, you know, that are the effects of this climate change. And you, when you open the news on a daily basis, you know, this is what you see, you know, you hear about flood killing people, heat waves here and there, you know, so it's, it's not a new thing that, that, that this thing is happening. So it's actually a reality. And, um, and uh, uh, one of the consequences of this is that it can disrupt national economies and also affect lives of millions of people, especially the poor, poor populations. Uh, the poorer population and those who are gonna be more vulnerable to the effects of our climate change. And according to IPPC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we have until 2030, you know, to call that anthropogenic sources of carbon dioxide. And now we are in 2021. So that means that we have nine years more to go. So I, I, I don't know how we'll be able to achieve this because uh, um, the time is nearer than we thought. And also uh, for us also to, uh, to be able to um, avoid even worse effect of climate change, these things has to be uh, put in place. And also it was projected that by 2050, you know, carbon dioxide emissions should reach net zero where emissions are in balance with removers. So in essence, you know, the amount of carbon dioxide being released into the environment, you know, should, should, should be equal to the amount being um, removed from the environment. So how are we going to achieve this in 2050? It's, it's going to be less than a miracle, you know? And uh, if we are not careful, you know, this is going to be even a much worse pandemic than even the COVID-19. So um, this is just a, a graph showing the, uh, the carbon dioxide emission uh, 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 based on the G20 co countries. And um, you will see the red on, on this slide, the, the red uh, uh, bar is showing the world average of carbon dioxide emissions. I, I don't know why my thing is running faster than me, <laughs> okay? And um, so basically you will see that um, most of the developed countries, you know, are actually emitting uh, a lot of carbon dioxide into the environment. And um, South Africa is, uh, is also a corporate. So uh, also the emission in from South Africa is so, also above the world average as well. And this tells us that um, actually some countries really need to work on how they are going to re reduce the amount of carbon dioxide being emitted into the environment. Now, this particular uh, slide is showing the global land risk according to the World Economic Forum. And if you look at uh, uh, on the right hand side, the green diamond shows the most severe likelihood of, uh, of risk. And um, sorry, sorry, I don't know why my slide is running faster than me. <laughs> sorry about that. So, so we see that the green aspect, you know, um, we see climate action failure, biodiversity loss, extreme weather, natural disaster, human-made environmental disaster. Those are going to be the major thing that we need really need to focus on, you know, in terms of averting a lot a pandemic, um, a pandemic in future and if a severe impacts of climate change. And you also see that water crisis is also a, a huge 
our concern, which uh, the previous speaker also talked about. So what, what is climate mitigation? So, so it's these measures that we need to take to reduce the effect and risk of climate change. And it also involves uh, reduction of anthropogenic emissions, which we humans actually contribute to, and also reducing the concentration of these um, anthropogenic emissions in the, in the atmosphere. So um, the, basically the sectors that we need to actually uh, uh, focus on in terms of climate mitigation it's transport, you know, one of it is transport, you know, so what is it, what, what, what kind of fuel are we using, you know, in terms of uh, um, um, the transport mode that we use, is it mass transport, and are people living far away from where they're staying, which means that they're going to uh, travel a longer distance and they're going to emit uh, greenhouse gases into the environment. Forest and land use. We're clearing our forest to make way, to pay way for agriculture, to pay way for uh, expansion of urban areas. And also we need to think about how can we do reafforestation? How can we actually, you know, uh, restore degraded uh, forest as well? So those are the things that we need to really focus on. Agriculture and food, you know, agriculture, you know, we need to think about using organic uh, fertilizer instead of using inorganic fertilizer. So research has to be done into that. We need to think about how we can start using drought resistant um, uh, uh, planting, drought resistant foods, you know, those are the things we need to think about. So also in terms of industry as well, what kind of energy is being used in our industry, you know? So we need to be also energy efficient and also reduce the amount of greenhouse gases we are uh, giving into the environment. Our energy as well, you know, what is the source of our energy? You know, we need to see how we can shift to more renewable energy, also to avoid um, releasing a high amount of greenhouse gases in the environment. Our buildings and our cities has to be energy efficient, you know, for us to be able to reduce um, greenhouse gases in the, in the environment. We need to start insulating our buildings. We need to start making sure that when we are buildings, uh, you know, building our buildings, we make, need to make sure that maybe they they can face the direction of the sun, you know, and start thinking about also using more energy, you know, switch off the light, you know, also, training people about how to use and be more energy efficient. And also in terms of the, the planning of our cities, how do we plan our cities? Do we make it like a broad plan cities or make it, we make it more compact? So those are the things that we really need to think about in terms of the uh, climate mitigation. So what about climate resilience? So how can we actually implement climate resilience? That is the potential of a system, whether it's social or ecological to overcome and recover from the effects of a natural disaster. And I must say many countries, especially in Africa, you know, uh, are not climate, um, sorry about that, are not climate resilient. So now how do we build, how do we go about doing this now? Building resilience requires combined strategies to adapt and mitigate the effects of climate change, you know, while also promoting sustainable development. Yes, we need to be sustainable, but in doing that, we need to make sure that whatever actions we are putting in place, you know, actually help us also to adapt and also mitigate uh, the effects of climate change. And often at times, research has shown that communities have different capacity to adapt to climate change, you know, and the most uh, vulnerable, you know, what, the most vulnerable communities are those living in, in poverty. So poor communities are more vulnerable, which is not, which is a fact. And the reason being that, you know, it depends on the infrastructure and also uh, financial capacity of the, of the community. So some people can handle it, some communities can handle it better than other communities. Now, this particular slide uh, shows the continental climate change mitigation and resilience, you know, in terms of how can uh, different continents, you know, also be able to adapt to climate change or mitigate it. And we look at the vulnerability. And if you see on the slide, um, you will see that uh, um, Africa, you know, is the most vulnerable in terms of uh, the vulnerability to climate change. And they're also the ones that have the average, the, the average annual percentage change in population is increasing far more than other continents. So that is why it, a lot of research needs to be done uh, in Africa to see how climate can be mitigated and, and, and there could be climate resilience in Africa. So we see uh, countries like Europe, they are doing far, far better, you know, even Americas. And we see even Asia, you know, that used to have a huge amount of population, they are now trying to work on the on the amount uh, on the rate of increase in their population and their vulnerability also is far better than Africa. 
I mean, the, the ability to cope with uh, uh, vulnerability, that vulnerability is far less than Africa. So, so that shows us that Africa, you know, we, we have a long way to go in the African continent. Now, this slide basically shows you know, the countries that are best prepared for climate change. And we see most of all the countries here are actually, you know, uh, European countries or, or the United States of America, you know, so, so they are developed countries that, that are more, uh, more resourceful, you know, they have the resource to be able to deal with climate change impacts. So there's no African countries, you know, that's actually on this list. So that tells us that uh, uh, there's a lot to do for us to do in Africa. Now, this is one of some of the pictures showing, there's a few showing the effects of climate change in Africa. And we see that, you know, uh, you see that women are the most vulnerable to it, you know, because they have to travel long distance to get water, you know, and uh, which, which could be used for something better. And we also see that um, in the picture here as well, we see that here is a man, you know, uh, because there was flooding and he had to, <laughs> all the, his cows are flooded. So he had to, to start maybe carrying the cows or the goat and, and walking through the water and maybe the, 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 the water already is already disease infested. So you see that this, this is what is actually happening to the, to the vulnerable ones in Africa, which is actually the poor ones. So th this is just a small, uh, a, a little, a show of what is going on. So when you go on ground and you see, you know, the, the amount of devastation that is based on climate change, you know, we, we see that we need to take action as soon as possible. So, so now, why, why, how do we go about this? Now we need to take, think about the transdisciplinary approach, you know, for climate management. And the transdisciplinary approach involves science, collaboration, and people. So that means that yes, science is needed. Often at times we only concentrate on, on the science aspect of it. But now we also need to think about the collaboration. You know, we need to collaborate with the public, public need to collaborate with the private sectors, NGOs, you know, where and all stakeholders, you know, that have a stake in the issues of climate change. So, and science needs to be communicated, you know, to, to the public as well. So science cannot just be that thing that is far away from people from reaching, or maybe even the layman cannot understand the science that we're doing, whether in the research institutions or in our academic institutions. So science, the science of climate change, you know, must be communicated in such a way that the layman can understand. And that people also need to be, to be brought into this equation as well, because it's the people that is experiencing it, it's the people that is contributed to it. So the awareness and the education you know, of, of people about this issue needs to be brought to the fore. So I wrote here that the transdisciplinary trans uh, approach goes beyond the use and application of academic research findings in other sectors. So there has to be societal impact and participation are crucial aspect of this approach. So any research that we do must have an impact in society. So there's some success stories of this type of collaboration. We have, for example, the indigenous knowledge of the people, uh, uh, knowledge of the people about pest resistant and pest pro crops was used to develop a technology for better misproduction in three European Ethiopian communities. So what actually happened here is that you know they they, they spoke to the people on ground and they understand you know the kind of crops that they've been using that has been able to withstand some drought situation and they were able to you know study further uh, on this type of crops in academic institutions so we also have the uh, the future resilient for african cities and land project in south africa which was used to understand the southern african regional climate responses to human drivers of climate change and um, and this has helped to enhance the integration of scientific climate knowledge into city Region and municipality decision making. So it's not just that they carry out the research, but they try to also implement it, you know, on the local level. So whatever research we are doing, it has to start from the grassroots level. And also, you know, in Indonesia, you know, there was a traditional project that was investigated how renewable energy could be implemented to meet the need and aspiration of rural and remote communities. So they went into the grassroots, they spoke to the people, and they found out what is their need, what is already on ground, so that they can work with what is on ground with the people. Also in Southeast Queensland, uh, 
Climate Adaptation Research Initiative. You know, this project helps to understand the vulnerability to climate change in that area and also develop adaptation strategies to assist decision makers in government, industry, and the community. So, in essence, what I'm trying to say is that research cannot just be done up there. We need to come down to the level of the people. So, this is where the collaboration comes from. So, the science, you know, the science must fit to what will help the people and the people's uh, perceptions and understanding of what is going on in the environment must feed into the science loop as well. So what are the challenges you know, in terms of this interdisciplinary approach? Number one is that there's conflicts. Conflicts easily arise from divergent values, interests, claims of legitimacy and knowledge claims of transdisciplinary stakeholders. So you see some people say, my discipline is more superior, my discipline is more, um, is more needed in this particular area. So everybody, every discipline want to claim that, you know, they are the best. They are the one that can do it better. But if we are going to move forward and we're going to work together, you know, we need to understand that everybody contributes, every discipline actually brings something to the table. There's also this issue of team development and physical interaction of all stakeholders could be difficult due to regional and financial constraints. So sometimes you may find out the issue of climate management may involve, you know, people working across regions, you know, and sometimes also lack of money, especially in Africa, may be an issue that may hamper, you know, the issue of climate management. Also, the development of theoretical and practical knowledge and methodologies to adequately execute a project. Now, in doing this kind of uh, transdisciplinary kind of research, it involves, you know, merging uh, different uh, methodologies. That means that the method of one discipline may not just be sufficient. So it may mean that we need to improvise or we need to uh, scale up some methods to be able to uh, apply it to this new phenomenon that we are confronted with. So those are the sure. things that yeah sure. sorry uh, sorry i'm interrupting everybody today it's like um i can i ask you to also wrap it up so that we can maybe have time for a question or two oh, okay. before we okay. finish that okay. would be great thank you Okay, okay, I'll, I'll quickly go through. So, and also the, the, the career development requirement of researchers also does not um, um, favor this kind of thing because they almost always want to focus on just a, um, a specific discipline. And um, this particular slide shows the kind of challenges, you know, that uh, Africa is facing. And um, in terms of the climate management, and we see that there's uh, mostly limited institutional capacity. Um, that is the major uh, constraint that has been faced in terms of climate management and also lack of finance. And uh, here we see that um, there's a many projects now in Africa uh, relating to climate, you know, that has been funded. And um, most of this um, uh, funding started from 2006, and there's a lot of money as of 2018 that has been pumped into this project. So what are the possible solutions? We have, uh, we need to still think about exchange and integration of knowledge. Academic institutions need to start including performance and promotion measures that encourage researchers to participate in transdisciplinary projects. Funding should be more flexible to, to accommodate this. And um, I'm sorry, um, I think I'm, um, <laughs> I, I'm going very fast. And uh, also we need to start learning by doing and doing by learning as well. So in conclusion, I will say that if proper climate action is taken, it's going to yield better growth and development. Uh, transdisciplinary approach is very important. And according to Paul Pullman, climate change is sometimes, sometimes misunderstood as being about changes in the weather. In reality, it's about changes in the in a way of life, okay? And outcomes from research, that is based on my own opinion and my outcome from my research, will not bring about, outcomes from research will not bring about a change unless people are willing to change the way they do things. And I have this funny thing that says, uh, what is the major challenge that we were confronted in terms of managing uh, climate management? Who wants change? Everybody raise up their hands. Who wants to change? Nobody wants to change. So everybody puts their hands down. And who wants to lead this change? You'd find nobody else that wants to do it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Shola. Your last slide has made me um, laugh out loud over here. It is very true. Uh, thank you so much for that talk. Um, I think the fact that, like, like, as you said, this is a very complex problem. It needs multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary approaches to solve. I think that has been uh, very much the theme of today's uh, webinar. Everybody has, um, everybody, everybody's been echoing that, that we need, uh, to some degree, a bottom-up approach, talking to the communities themselves, but also we need the political will, the political change, and then 
Shola, you were also talking about the incentives that we need for researchers because um, everybody wants change, but you know, who's going to lead the change unless the incentive is there? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody that would like to quickly ask a question for uh, Prof. Olalade before we wrap up our um, meeting. I have some questions in mind, but I feel I haven't given the floor much chance uh, to speak up uh, in, in, in this um, session today. Is there anybody that would like to ask one question for uh, Prof. Shola Olalade? You can put your hand up or just... Um, uh, okay. Uh, Alisa. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm fair? Samuel Adelabu. Um, I don't know whether it's a question, but something that has been bothering my mind, probably we could have some sort of discussion about this. I was with some scientists recently, and uh, we've been talking about this issue of climate change. And let me state upfront that I'm not part of those people who deny the effect or the existence. Of climate of change, climate but I think change. no. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, sorry, somebody else had their microphone on. All right. So can I continue? Okay. All right. My my, my major concern is that as scientists, we are not doing a good job to explain um, that the concept of climate change. I mean, before we can talk about climate adaptation, we must first convince people that there is climate change and most of the challenges that we are having now is that it's like it's been forced on us to believe that there is climate change and the the golden um uh, rule or the golden words nowadays is climate change so if you go here if anything happens within the environment it's as a result of climate change if this happens it's as a result of climate change and you know ipcc tell us that for instance after 30 years um anything that happens or changes like that is like a climate change but maybe the, the things that we need to do is that uh, what do we need to do as scientists as environmental managers to actually prove that some of these things are existence because if you look at some of the ind indigenous knowledge that people will see some people will come Sorry, um, Sam, you want to try again? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, my, my major concern is that we had so many people who are talking about climate change and as scientists, we, we tend not to prove to them that there is climate change. There are many people uh, many indigenous people who will contest with us. I am not a denier of climate change, like I said. I believe that there's climate change. But what do we scientists need to do to show that there is climate change? Currently, we have 30 years in Tavros, according to according to IPCC, that if anything's happened in 30 years, then it's climate change. My concern is everything that we hear now are these is about climate change. If you see uh, a river or that dried up, maybe it's just normally dried up with every 25 years, every 30, 30 years. It's climate change. Everybody's, it's like the money, the thing that gets money nowadays. If you have not put, if you want to write a research now, proposal, if you have not put the word climate change in it, it seems that you are not going to get funded. But is there really climate change in some of these things? Maybe it's a discussion. Thank you, Alisa. Uh, thank you, Sam, for, for your comment. I think we, we don't really have time to address and unpack such a meaty comment. Uh, so maybe you and Shola, since you are luckily at the same institution, can uh, just take that discussion further. And uh, thank you, everybody. We've had a very lively and very informative session today, I, I believe. And um, I think a lot of the things raised here will keep on informing future discussions. Uh, I hope that we can also uh, continue some discussions on Facebook where all of these sessions will be posted. So more questions and answers can also be posed there, I hope, and we can continue this um, fantastic conversation. Um, and of course, it's not just about climate change, as Sam has said, but also 
about uh, all of the other crises we're currently facing, including the COVID crisis that is closely related, sadly, to climate change. So um, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate this attendance. I appreciate all four speakers. We will, we will uh, share the link to the um, uh, recording afterwards with everybody. And um, I hope to see you all again next week, same time, same place, same link. And we'll have a lineup of four new exciting speakers. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.